Guys, we're getting real. Y'all, we're getting real. I'm taking off my shoes. Me and Rachel just met. We're best friends. I'm taking off my shoes right now. I'm going to cross my legs. Yeah. My ankles might be ashy, but no. we're going to get real comfortable here yeah. because Rachel just creates this kind of environment. That's what we're trying to That's do. That's what we're trying to do here, baby. My first ever video was a, it's not lo no longer up, not because it's bad, because I have lots of bad videos up, it just doesn't represent who I am anymore. It was a spoken word piece cool. about like giving back culture, religion, all these things, but it was also just very awkward. I wasn't myself in it. Uh, and then I did tutorials, then I did comedy videos, then I did rants straight to camera. I did a bunch of different things. And until how old I are you at this age? Mm, in 2010, I probably went to math if I'm 34. If I'm 30, let's use the math. Here's the math. If I'm 34 now, right? How old would I have been in 2010? Anyone? Assistant, show me. 22. 22. Yes, oh, she's okay. so good. I mean, ready. Shout outs to the teams yeah. behind the people Honestly, who just that make tell us, us look. We get the things. credit, but it's yeah. really the team behind the people. The person, like there's someone behind Rachel calculator. just holding strings uh -huh, uh -huh. and puppeteering. Exactly. <laughs> So you were 22 yes. and you jump on this thing. Did you have any, um, I'm thinking of what it would be today. So maybe this didn't exist as much back then, but like, did you have sort of a, who am I to be making these videos or like, nobody's going to care about this. Or you were just like, I'm funny. I'm throwing this up there. That's a great question. I think what really drove me was more so that there wasn't much to compare myself to out there already. It wasn't like I was seeing a bunch of content that was relatable to me and I was like, oh, why Why does my voice matter in this conversation? I didn't see my voice in the conversation to begin with. And I think that's why I gained a lot of traction is there I am, a South Asian girl, talking about periods, mm -hmm. talking about dating, talking about taboo subjects, mental health, all these awkward body stories that like, I think for a lot of girls, I could have been their first person they ever saw publicly talking about those things and also owning these things in a comedic way you know not being hush hush about it not be not beating around the bush but just straight up being like it sounds really simple today for me to say this but I'm trying to take myself back to to being 22 living in my parents house making videos in their basement being in that time and place and I'm trying to think of like just saying the sentence of like oh my god I have period cramps right now and my boyfriend is really annoying me yeah like that sentence yeah is pretty revolutionary for a young girl that's like wait what right no adult has ever talked to me about my period no adult has ever even called it my period they've never even used this language yes they never addressed the fact that i could have a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever so i think i was a first in that way for a lot yeah. of people when people approach me and say i grew up with your videos they very much will say it in a way that's like you were my sister kind of guiding me through this this period of my life. It's so cool. And weirdly, I haven't ever thought this before, but there is so, many, so much similarity to me, but with writing. Mm -hmm. So when I started, well, I started writing long before anyone cared about what I was writing, but the book that finally got some traction was the book where I was talking about the things you weren't supposed to talk about. I was talking about back fat and the hair that grows out of the mole on my butt and <laughs> yeah. periods and postpartum depression mm -hmm. after I had my kids and all of these things because I felt like this was 2017 when I was writing that book, but I felt like everything I saw was this very polished, very perfect, very mm -hmm. Pinterest, like filtered. And every time I would look at those women, I'm like, I'm not that. And yeah. I don't know how to be that. And like, you gotta have bad days too. And so I wrote about it all, but tried to do it through a lens of humor. Yeah. So it really is, I think now very easy for people to hear you say like, who cares you're talking about your period. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to 2010, people were not having those conversations. Right. And I love that you said like, had never heard that word before. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a very religious home mm -hmm. and we basically didn't have a body below our chin. Like we yeah. didn't talk about anything down here. Right. And so when I'm telling these stories, there are women in the audience who are like crying, laughing, because they're like, yeah, my mom also didn't tell me how to use any of the mm -hmm. products. And so mm -hmm. I had to figure out how to insert a tampon by myself. Mm -hmm. But then you have people who are looking at you like, what? Nobody explained yeah. to you how this worked. I'm like, no, no, they did not. Mm -hmm. And when nobody talks about that stuff, it makes, at least for me, definitely made me feel like these things were wrong because yeah. we didn't discuss it. 
hundred percent. On that note, I'm gonna do a quick pivot to say since we're so comfortable here, I want everyone listening to know I'm sl- my voice sounds slightly raspy. I'm gonna sit uncomfortable. I'm just gonna be like a pr- yes. very imperfect human. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, like, that's hundred percent. We're gonna be really imperfect here, you and we're gonna get really feet real in here. The seat, yes, you put it up. You we're do gonna be you want. real. I got. I'm a little nasally. Yeah, <laughs> my hair's a little frizzy, but I'm here as a human. We're right. gonna have a human conversation. Right. And I love that you said that. I'm gonna tell you a quick story, which is. And I only recently became okay with telling these types of stories because even into full adulthood, I felt some level of shame and embarrassment around certain bodily things. And I don't even want to frame my upbringing as one where my parents were like super, super strict. My parents actually did the best that they knew how to do with what they experienced as kids as well. So it's not like my mom had an agenda to be like, I'm going to not tell her this, this, and this so that she struggles. She just didn't know. And so as an adult, same thing. Did not know how to put in, put in tampons. Did not feel comfortable saying certain words like vagina, right. penis, sex. Like that was terrifying for me, even as an adult, to mm-hmm. say those words. Even today, when I say it, I have to like give myself a little You're bit like, of like a, mm, like if I flex my core a little bit, like I just did it. If you right. pause and rewind and punch in, you'll see I went sex. Like I had to really get in there. But I remember when I moved to LA, I had such an embarrassing moment, and I felt so shameful because I had invited over a bunch of other YouTubers to come shoot this video with me. And one of the segments of the video was just like period humor. And I was like, hey guys, bring over like, you know, pads, tampons, whatever you want to use for like this thing. And one of them had responded to be like, oh my God, ew, pads, who the hell uses pads? And I did because I had no idea about anything else in life. And I was so embarrassed. And I felt so bad about myself for so long being like, what is wrong with me? to be so stunted as an adult to not be able to say these words and know these things. And over the past couple of years, even I've gone on this journey to just like one, stop judging myself and just really unsubscribing from this idea of shame because shame is just a weapon I refuse to be controlled by mm. anymore. I'm like, it is such a we- weapon used, especially towards women, especially towards, especially women. towards women. And I'm just like, I'm going to fully own things, talk about them and just like, lean in and be like i'm i'm here to learn and have the discussion but you're not going to make me feel bad yeah. about anything related to my body yeah anymore. it's well, just not going to happen i um i've talked about this quite a bit on the show but i swear truly swear I did not understand how my cycle worked until about three years ago. I saw your video on yeah, this, actually. Yeah, I, I literally yeah. did not know until, because nobody, I mean, I grew, I had two older sisters mm-hmm. and a mama. We did not talk about it. And I didn't know that it would show up around the same time. I didn't know I could count it. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. Yeah. And I only learned about it when I had to, when my hormones were in such a fluctuating state that I felt like I couldn't control my emotions anymore. That was when I was like, oh shit, you need to know what's going on with your mm-hmm. body. So um, I have recommended the book 1000 times, but it's called Period Power by Maisie Hill. I cannot tell wow. enough people about this, okay. but that was a book that taught me about my body, about my clitoris, which is a word that makes me turn I red. just clenched yeah, right now. I know. I don't, I, <laughs> it was an involuntary, <laughs> like my jaw just went. Part, just say it. Yeah, it um, is so it's stupid. Just, it's so, it's, but I'm so glad we can relate because it's actually the second conversation I've had like this, this right. week, where someone else also like kind of cringe saying right. the word vulva. Right. And that's, I don't know about you, but my upbringing, the reason I, 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 going back to your original question about YouTube of me saying period being such a big deal is because in my upbringing, the words we used were like, Time of the month, my thing. I got my thing. Time of the month. and this is a real one for for those of you that don't know. And I'm not throwing South Asian culture under the bus because the truth is this is across every single culture in the world. But specifically in my culture, my vagina was called my shame shame, dude. For one my entire of my life, girlfriends. I literally you were saying I'm like she's gonna call it her shame shame yeah. because my girlfriend is yeah. exactly. And I'm like the same. that's. Yes, up. <laughs> she told me that like yes. five years ago. She was like, oh, yeah, my mom. Call-. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. And not one shame, two shames. Yeah, two shame, double shame. shame. Double shame. So it's shame like, to the power of two. Yeah. So and but it, like she was like, yeah, but we would say it in sort of this cutesy yeah. kind of way. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't she's such a feminist. And she, now she's like, holy, yeah. that was so terrible yeah. that she did it. Her mom did it. Her mom. It was like going back generations. That's what they said. Totally. When did you understand or when did you start to unpack like Oh, dang. Okay, wait. I need to reframe this for myself. I need to reframe all these things. Is that more recent? I'm going to be 100% honest with you. Yeah. Within like the last year and a half. Yeah. I'm 34 years yeah. old. Yeah. And I don't want anyone listening to be like, I'm too old to figure this out. I'm too old. No. Exactly. Like it is, 
Yes. I am fully admitting. Yeah. 34 years old. Mm-hmm. Like, just now I've become so comfortable. And it's because I've acti- actively been doing the work. I've, I, you know, I have a fund that deals with girls and women and specifically addresses shame. And uh, my chip on my shoulder is gender equality. And I've just learned that if I want to stand up for that cause, I have to also live a certain way yeah. in my actual life. Yes. So in my actual life, I'm like, no. I will not be calling anything my shame. Shame. Right. I will not be governed by shame because I'm trying to change that in the right. world. And so, well, I also think, for me, I talk about. I mean, Jack. God bless. Jack's been with me forever. He's had Shout to out Jack. me talk about my uterus, my period, whatever. Because I'm like, you know what? If half of our human population has to deal with this every single month, we're managing the emotions. We're dealing with actual care of our bodies because of this thing we're taking iron supplements Mm -hmm. because like we're still at 40 years old there's a solid chance i could bleed through my clothes we're still dealing with all this shit if half of us have to deal with that then we should be allowed to openly talk about it and have a conversation and have it be normal Mm -hmm. have it be normal that like oh hey this is i'm on my period like this is what's happening right now till this day actually let's say till this day i have to go to the bathroom to like change a tampon why am I hiding You're it? You're hiding it. I'm You're opening my back. It. It's an yes. entire. I'm opening my back like a smidge. What I do is I have a long sleeve. And we know the trick. You take the long of sleeve. Course. You shove it shove in the it sleeve. Right in there. I'm walking like this. Honestly. To the ba- and then in, the, in and then here's the funny part. You're in the stall with other yeah. women. And you're. And then you're gonna fake off <laughs> to cover that. Like, why am I doing dude, that? Why I am I doing this? I've wanted to make a joke forever about how quietly in middle school I tried to open the pad yeah, so that yeah. nobody knew I was opening 100%. a pad. But obviously, like everyone else was in the same situation. I, yeah. Sometimes I would open it in my backpack. Oh, so it's ready. So it's ready. <laughs> so there was no sound. I'd be like, <laughs> and then, but like, what? But also. Why are they so loud? But also, yes. it doesn't matter. Right. It's so it's bananas. Everything. I'm glad you said that because it is something that I've only really started to unlearn yeah. in the last few years. So it's cool that it's the same for you. You're totally. younger. You got a head start. Oh, well. But it's important, I think, for women who are listening to this, people who are listening to this, bleeders who are listening yes. to this, to understand that at any point you can begin to really – not just understand your body, but learn how to work with it yeah. and love it and appreciate it. Because that was a huge thing for me was understanding that I would have different strengths mm. based on where I was in my cycle. And I still don't know that. Okay. You got to read this book. Okay. I'll give it to you before okay. you leave. Knowing um, my fabulous assistant, she's already ordered it. Oh, yeah. She's while listening it. to this. She's I'm already, also yeah. going to take off my shoes. Yes. Take thing. off your shoes. Okay. Guys, get we're getting coffee. real here. Y'all, we're getting real. I'm taking off my shoes. Coffee. Me and Rachel just met. We're best friends. I'm taking off my shoes right now. I'm going to cross my legs. Yeah. My angles might be ashy, but no. we're going to get real comfortable here yeah. because Rachel just creates this kind of environment. That's what we're trying to That's do. That's what we're trying to do here, baby. Uh, so this is this will actually change your life because you're becoming more comfortable with your body. Mm-hmm. But this concept of understanding that your cycle is a superpower not a weakness. I've never considered my cycle to be a superpower. Okay. So that's, it, that's gonna intriguing. It's going to change everything. Because for as long, until about three years ago, for as long as I had it, every single month, I'd be like, oh, look, oh, it's coming. Like, you know, I'd be so pissed. That's me. Right. But think about what that does energetically to your body. Your body is just working the exact way it's supposed to. When your period shows up, it means that everything is doing exactly what it's meant to do. And every time your body does what it's meant to do, you get mad at it. Okay, follow-up question. Yes. <clears throat> I've heard legend... Did I mess this up? I'm sorry. Is this okay? Follow-up question. Legend has it. Someone told me this once, and I was like, huh? One of my friends is super into, like, the science behind periods and all the ways the body's supposed to work. And she t- said to me, your period is not supposed to be that painful. That is correct. That PMS? sounds like wizardry to me. No, PMS, When you're saying that yeah. to me, I'm like... Because no. my period is very painful. Okay. And so- it has always been pretty painful. So... To, that I mean, is there why I hate it. Could my be period. other things mm-hmm. going on, but typically, really intense PMS is a sign that something's not right with your body. And usually, that sign is stress related. Mm, you don't have a job up. that's stressful that in checks any way. Out. My <laughs> job is not stressful at all. <laughs> you don't work really hard and not get enough sleep. And, Wait, yeah. so you're telling me that periods aren't supposed to be that painful? They're not, you're, like si- cramps, all the things that we associate with PMS are not supposed to be there. So certainly, like, in fact, when my body starts to feel crampy, when I'm, I'm like, oh, I pushed too hard. I didn't take care of it in the right way. Something's going on. What it's is ac- this scam that I have lived with my entire life? That we all life. have lived with, dude. 
all of us. I, from the moment I got my period, first wasn't even taught about it, but then right. eventually was told that, like, no, it's supposed to hurt. Right. Here are all the medications yeah, and yeah. all the things to take because well, it hurts. Right. So in my religious culture, it was that Eve had created, had, had the original sin. She ate the apple in the Garden of Eden, and now every woman forever would suffer because of the actions of Eve in the garden. I know. It's wild. It's wild. We all bought into it. It's okay. I know. I, there's more where they came from, from all the cultures around the world. So don't you worry. Right. But but it is something that we accept. So one, understanding that your body should, this is a really natural process that should be happening and shouldn't be as intense as it is. I have also the most amazing doctor you can talk to. She's a natural path. She helped me balance my hormones. No medicine. I'm all just like to have supplements. you on speed dial I, because you seem to have all the recommendations. This is a passion for me in the last I love few years that. because I feel like it's something that would help so many women and the solutions are not, they're not medicine. It's like take this supplement, get more sleep, make sure that you're having these kind of nutrients in the week leading up to your period. It's really simple things that make massive difference. So that's one, but the superpower idea changed everything for me. So during every single cycle or every single week of your cycle, your body's doing different things. So during, at least for me, during the week of my period, I feel I used to just be like, oh, I don't have energy. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm grouchy. I'm all totally, these things. Yeah. The flip of that is I'm more grounded. I'm closer to the earth. I'm more centered. This is my time for reflection. This is my time to release, literally, to let go of anything that I've carried for the last month that I don't need to have with me anymore. Uh, the week after your period, for about 10 days, uh, most likely is when most of us would ramp up to ovulation again mm -hmm. and when that's happening that is when you are your most charismatic it's when other people will find you the most attractive that's the time to like pitch a new idea try and hire somebody go on a date like if you learn what each week what? is for and you do as much as you can to plan your life around that that fluctuation it's a game changer i've literally never heard any of me the things either right now. me either until i started doing research and reading these books and then i was like oh my, we're actually so powerful and we have no idea. That's why the book is called Period Power. Because it's like, no. You're blowing my mind I right know. now. You it's are the, blowing okay, my here, mind right here's now. Here's one more thing. Tell me. That tell me the thing. This world is built on a circadian rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. But a circadian rhythm is male. A circadian rhythm is because that's their cycle. People who bleed, who have a uterus, yeah. we are on an infradian rhythm. That is 28 to 32 days. It takes a full month for you to completely go through your mm -hmm. cycle. So who you are today, completely different person than who you're going to be next week because you're going to be in a different spot in your cycle and your hormones will be different. But if you actually start to track your cycle and you're like, man, on day 10, I had really low energy. On day 15, mm -hmm. I felt amazing. Yeah. And you track that every month, you would find that that is true on the same day every single month. So if you know that and you have control over your schedule, which as this entrepreneur and the creator, you do hopefully sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. But you could plan launching an event. You could plan shooting a show. You could plan doing these things around when you know it's going to be best for you hormonally. It's, it's a game changer. This sounds too good to be true. It's true. What is the secret it's that has not been book. shared? Well, I think that if we all we're sort of going back to a time where we lived in villages and maybe there were wise right, women right. and we would get that information passed mm -hmm. down to us. And I just think it's been lost because we've been told that this thing is shameful and we're not supposed to talk about it. It's all a scam. It's all a scam. It's all a scam. The scams continue. Yeah. I On a, a nice transition out of our conversation about periods. because Which I hope you thoroughly enjoyed. I, I, I did. really did. I super enjoyed this. <laughs> um, I have noticed, and maybe you tell me, oh, I've been doing that forever, but I feel like more and more on your social, I'm seeing like not things that are built maybe to entertain, but things that you're like, I'm really thinking about this and I need you to know about it too. Mm -hmm. Like it feels a lot more, you're talking directly to camera. It's more serious. Maybe I'm just like, Lily, are you talking to me? <laughs> uh, is that a new thing or is that something you've always done? I mean, I always, I feel like I love the power of entertainment. I really believe in the power of humor mm -hmm. to Same. communicate messages. Yeah. So I think from my very first YouTube videos to now, I've always believed that like there's a message in everything I do. Even if sometimes it's just like, hey, 
I've had a really crappy day. I'm going to make you laugh about this thing and my message just about like taking life a little less seriously. Or sometimes it's about like gender equality or like shame, but I'm, I'm lathering it in humor. I've kind of always done that, but recently I have kind of switched up things on my socials just to like combat the amount of noise there is. Honestly, I've just felt recently that there's so m- and I'm super guilty of it. I see a bunch of headlines that have not great energy. I spend so long going through the comments because yeah. I know people will be fighting in them and I'm gravitating towards that energy. Ooh, there's a headline about this artist. I know people are going to say this. Like, and I, I don't like that I do that. Mm-hmm. And I was doing that a lot and I thought, I'm going to combat that with just some like real, genuine, human experience type of post. So recently what I've been doing is I'll post something funny, but I'll do a little a bit of a longer caption just to tell people where my head is at. Yeah. And like some very vulnerable feelings. And I'm doing that in a very imperfect way. Yeah. I'm not doing it in a way where I need you to agree with me. I'm just telling you about a very real human experience I'm having. And one I did recently was I went home to surprise my parents in yeah, Toronto. Yeah, I saw that. And I think so much of <clears throat> what I see online these days, and I, this, this, I'm going to be just like super honest about this, I think there's this expectation for people to be perfect, Um, especially when you talk about immigrant parents. There's a lot of content online about like generational trauma and I'm really struggling because my parents are this and that's all super valid, Mm -hmm. super valid. But I also believe in having grace. Like I feel like grace is so important and it's progress, not perfection. And if people can't redeem and if people can't learn, where does that leave us in this world? And so I, I, I make, crack, crack a lot of jokes about how immigrant parents are really bad at being affectionate. You know, my dad has said I love you maybe once in my life. I can recall, like, he's not very vocal. He said maybe a, I am the words I'm proud of you perhaps twice. But I went home to surprise my parents in Toronto. So they did not know I was coming home. I walked into the house and I looked at my dad's laptop and two windows are open just playing my YouTube videos, just a playlist of my YouTube videos playing throughout the day. And this is something he did in 2010 when I started making YouTube videos because he believed in his heart that like, I could give her 50 views today. Like if I've watched 50 of her videos, it'll be 50 views Aww. and it'll really make a difference. Now fast forward to today where, yeah, my YouTube videos are still there, but I don't consistently make YouTube videos. It's not where I make the majority of my income. It is not what I would consider my career. I, I have TV shows, I have movies. I'm doing other things that aren't tied to the success of my YouTube channel. So for me to come home and to see that still till this day, he is playing my YouTube videos just in the background. Like YouTube CEO, if you're listening to this, like, yes, my dad is fully scamming the system. <laughs> but I'm also told that when he goes to work, he also on every computer at work in the background just has my YouTube videos mm-hmm. playing in auto. And my caption was basically about the fact that it's really easy to say, oh my God, my parents never said this to me. They never showed me they loved me in my love language. The reality is my parents know nothing about love languages. Yeah. They know they, no, they did vernacular. not grow up yeah. talking and reading about love languages. This is their way of saying I love you. And I'm not sitting here saying that we should all just accept being loved in a way that isn't right for us, but I'm saying that does not mean there's an absence of love. Yeah. We still need to recognize that someone is showing you love. And sometimes it's okay to be like, you know what? It's not perfect. Yeah. But I still really, really appreciate it and it means something to me. Yeah. That's so I'm just cool. kind of like cutting through a little bit of the BS of this whole like everyone's got to be perfectly pro- and progress has got to be perfect because yeah. it's not how it's going to be. This is such a, a good one because I had this really beautiful awareness recently. Um, I've always said about my parents, they did the best they could with what they had. Mm-hmm. But what is also true is that the best they could wasn't always very great. Correct. But I was thinking about my dad and I will sometimes see other people with their dad and get jealous or get sad or think like wow what would it be like to have a dad like that I had this awareness of feeling like oh I wish he could have been like this or I wish he could have been like that and then thought you know what if I look back on my dad's life and his childhood and everything that he lived through it's actually kind of amazing that he stayed upright Mm -hmm. it's kind of amazing that he didn't become an addict that he didn't become that he didn't check out that he didn't honestly it's kind of amazing that he didn't have suicidal ideology and then take that all the way through Mm -hmm. to the end because he's had a very hard life and it was the first time that I thought you know what he did he kept working he kept working meaning 
that he put food on our table and he made sure that rent was paid. Mm -hmm. That's what my dad could do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get, um, even right now it's making me emotional because I'm like, oh, I, daddy, I wish you could have this or I wish you could be like that. And I'm like, he stuck around. He stuck around, which is something that so many other dads didn't do. And that's what he could do. Mm -hmm. And I need to honor that piece yeah. because I'm looking at his parenting of what I, I wish it was instead of honoring the best that he could mm -hmm. or the best that he could bring into the situation. Um, and I thought that the other day, I'm like, I need to call him and just say like, you know what? Thank you. Because I think I've always sort of seen that as maybe not enough. Right. And that was the most. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Yeah. It's, and I'm not sure if this is something that like also comes with age. I'm sure it is. I'm sure as a teenager, I, I, I might not have had, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's teenagers listening to this that are like, no, I fully have this awareness and kudos to you. Yeah. I did not yeah. as a teenager. So I don't know if this is something that comes with age. I'll tell you another really vulnerable one. So, and this is like me keeping it super 100. So there's been things throughout my life that I've been very passionate about causes gender equality I've mentioned like six times now but like you know the black lives matter the black lives matters uh movement the lgbtq plus community there's certain things that I'm very just like are big in my life mm -hmm. that I've had to sit down and have conversations with my parents about just because like they might not understand exactly all the information about these issues they might not understand how to help they might not understand how to be advocates they might not have the right language I've always sat them down and I remember there's one conversation I was having <clears throat> during the pandemic where I was explaining to my parents like why people are protesting, especially living in L.A. where protests were huge, explaining to my parents like why people are protesting. And <clears throat> I remember me explaining some of this information to my mom and her not knowing a lot of it. And I think it's really easy to sit there and be judgmental, especially like if you're someone looking in to the situation, strange, like, oh, my God, how could you not know this? Like. And it's very easy, especially on the internet, for people to say, it's your job to get educated. It's your job to know these things. How could you not know these? You don't care. My mom said one sentence to me, and it really put everything into perspective. My mom has been so receptive to every conversation I've ever had with her. But when we were talking about the protest, she said to me, oh, I didn't know a lot of that. And I, in a judgmental moment, was like, well, mom, how could you not know? And she said, the first time I ever saw a black person was when I was 20 something and I moved to Canada after I got married. And I was like, wait, what? Wow. She's like, that was the first time I've ever had a conversation with a black person. Wow. So that puts things into perspective with you a little bit. Like, this is a person that's so willing to learn and so willing to be an advocate, but does not have that life of experience that we expect everyone to have to meet us. So I think it's. We really have to meet people and when they're willing to be advocates and when they're willing to be part of it, we have to give some grace right. to be like, yes, let us bring you in. It's the same thing of, you know, the queer community. I came out at the age of 30. That is not easy mm. for my Indian parents to deal with. It is not. And when I did it, was the reaction perfect? No, it was not. Did they use the right words? Absolutely not. And I think for two years, I was resentful about that. I was like, well, why didn't they know this? How could they not, how could they not have the right language? How could they tell me maybe this is a phase? How could they say all the things that are so wrong? But the reality is like, and you can, as a listener, decide if this is sad or if this is beautiful, and I think it's a mix of both. They did not kick me out of their house. They sat down with me and had a conversation with me. And now we have a really, really great relationship. So. It's for me to decide, do I get hung up on your reaction of not knowing the right words and not immediately being perfect? Or is there greater beauty in you saying, I'm not perfect, I'm going to learn as a full adult how to support my daughter over the right. next few years? Because I'm going to argue that the latter is more beautiful. Right. To be like, I am going to do the work to understand what this is because I have no frame of reference for this well, right now. Well, I do feel like there is a, a cultural... And it's, to me, sort of based in social media, this obsession that you have to, that every single thing that you say, you meaning anybody, mm -hmm. has to be absolutely perfect or I will listen to none of it. Right. But then it has to be absolutely perfect to the person mm -hmm. consuming it. And humans are flawed. Right. There is no way for us to know all the things 
to know all the things Mm -hmm. or to know all the perspectives. So I love the reminder of grace because I think not only are we expecting other people to, we're not giving it to other people, but it also means if you're not giving it to other people, you don't give it to yourself. Correct. So it's like, well, I am over here, you know, and you're, Mm -hmm. and it just becomes this thing where we are not having any conversations. And so we don't know. I have um, very dear friends who, uh, we're best friends and then we're like we're not just best friends and it was super hard for one side of that couple for mm-hmm. her parents and she was so graceful with that process mm-hmm. of just sort of allowing everybody to take the time that they needed to right. understand what it was and to understand that things had shifted and hey I'm more than you thought I was and this is what this looks like her her process of allowing her parents to kind of go slow was so beautiful because mm-hmm. I was as her friend like fuck of course, that of like course, they yes. better show up at yeah. the march like yeah. what is going on yeah. where's the pride flag exactly <laughs> and now her parents are the most incredible but it just it took grace it took a little time and I think what you said is absolutely right I think what I've learned is that you can only give grace to people if you're doing it for yourself. And there's a certain amount of self-love you have to have to give people grace. Because the reality is for two years after I came out, the reason I was resentful towards my parents and not giving them grace is because I was so insecure. This was a new thing for me. Mm. I was so insecure. I was still like experiencing this new part of myself. I felt like everyone was looking at me. I felt like everyone was judging me. So I was not in a place where I was comfortable enough to give grace so do you did you always know or it was a a, no i mean people could probably go back and dissect all of my all of my younger pictures and be like oh i can genuinely say that i know i was always like not to not to lean into gender norms for a second but i wasn't the most girliest girl not to say that everyone that's queer is not but i'm just saying i was i only had boyfriends exclusively yeah and when i came out to myself 30 days later i came out to my parents Okay, wait. Yes, I wanted to make a movie about this because I'm so type A that when I said to myself out loud, first person I came out to was my dog, but when I said it to myself (laughs) out loud, like, I think I am bisexual. I said that out loud. At that moment, I made a list of people I was going to tell before my 30th birthday, which was in like 30 days. Whoa. Yeah. So whether or not prior to that, I was like in relationships and I was like, this is right, but not completely like, and I think I'm also attracted to this person. But me actually saying that sentence out loud to myself 30 days before I told my parents. Wow. Yes. Wow, I'm like, I'm tripping out. Very similarly, I have friends who like, they look back and they're like, well, obviously. Yeah. But and I'm it sure if I go back, I could pick up yeah. instant. But it wasn't until they were right. adult, grown right. women that they were like, oh, wait a minute. Right, totally. All this to say that I feel like giving grace is def- de- definitely has to do with self-love. Yeah. It has to do with you being okay and comfortable and and having the love for yourself that you can then give to other people for sure. Is that self-love like a practice that you've had to lean into? Like how have you, have you always loved yourself? Or you like, cause for people who are listening to her like, you're right, but mm-hmm. I, how, how do I love myself more? What mm-hmm. does that look like for you? That's a great question. I think it looks differently every single day to be honest yeah for me right now what self-love looks like is being really really honest i'm gonna tell you for me specifically what it is (laughs) and i quote from my therapist i am such a person that is one of my biggest flaws or things i'm trying to work on is i have such high expectations of people and my therapist has made abundantly clear that's because I have such high expectations of myself. So even this understanding of everything we get irked about by other people is a reflection of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like everything in the world we experience, other people, any situation, all has to do with us. us. Nothing is about other people. Yep. Like truly, nothing it's is about other people. It's all a mirror. So I think really viewing the world through that lens of like, oh, this person annoyed me because they didn't accomplish this task has to do with me and how hard I am on myself and let me just tell myself that that's okay. It's okay if I don't always accomplish that task. Like this person being late and really wasting my time is a reflection of me because of how much time I feel I've wasted on certain things and not improving. Let me think about those times and know it's okay. Yeah. It's really about, 
and again, I'm not saying this is healthy or unhealthy. This is what helps me is I really try to think about all the times I like beat myself up or all the things I think are flaws. Fully acknowledge that they are. They're correct and that's okay. Not try to defend myself, not try to say why I'm like that, but just know I'm like that. Forgive myself for being like that. Try my best to improve all of those things, but understand that I'm a human and that's okay. Yeah. I'm allowed to be like that. That's actually a great place to start. I think of this when you know people ask questions about personal development. Mm-hmm. I always say start from a place of tension. Mm-hmm. Like find an area of tension in your life and then figure out. Like I got into personal development because I was having really, really debilitating anxiety attacks. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea how to... Uh, deal with that because it hadn't happened before and so I went on this journey to learn how to manage my anxiety and then that led to this whole other world so I've never thought of like find the tension through self-love mm. is like those pieces in your day where you're getting frustrated you're getting you're having that like spike of stress mm-hmm. to go Oop, this is a great opportunity to sort of like look a little deeper here and ask what's really going on I'm going to give you a specific example. Can I give yeah, you a specific example? Yeah, I love example? An Okay, this is like, oh this dreams. is the part of the episode where Lily quotes her therapist. <laughs> this is what we're doing right now. So one of the things me and my therapist talk about, and if you're a listener here, tell me if you were late. I get really tense about small things, but they all have the same pattern. And so I brought this to her. I was like, I get really upset about things that people do, which I don't think are valid to be upset about. For some reason, I have a compulsive need to get upset. Like... If someone, for example, like knocks that tray off the table and like doesn't address it or like wasn't apologetic, I can't let that go. Even though there's no harm done, like I have to be like, why did you do that? Yeah. I need to understand why you did that and why you're not apologizing about that thing. Like it's like a compulsion to understand people and why they're doing something and why they're not communicating about it in a way that I feel is taking ownership and then she like as therapists do dug into my childhood and she's like I think you have a discomfort with confusion when someone is doing something or saying something to you that is confusing to you in a way where you're like well how could you do this to me why aren't you doing what's right why aren't you doing this act that's morally aligned like it confuses you and it makes you really uncomfortable Yeah, and it's probably because like you know, I have been betrayed. I have had a lot of heartache and I've had a lot of like trust issues growing up. So she told me one simple sentence and it was in those moments, I want you to repeat one thing to yourself, which is compassion over confusion. I want you to know that you have an affinity towards being very irritated when you are experiencing someone that is confusing you about anything. So when you're feeling confused, just first practice love being like I'm being compassionate to myself because this is an area that I'm vulnerable in that's good and so I just need to like know that and know that my compulsion is not a right wrong it's just part of who I am right so like show some compassion and then proceed and it has really helped me just taking that second to be like okay I know what this is I can put a label on this this is me being confused and this is me this is not that exactly this is me being confused I know I'm doing this and we're gonna be compassionate it's funny because mine is people not following the rules Mm. Uh, so I get very stressed out when people don't follow the rules because I feel like I am supposed to follow the rules and if I am doing something that I think is following the rules and other people aren't but these are rules that don't make sense so if I let you into traffic and you don't give me a little wave (laughs) I'm real stressed out about that I am real stressed out and I'll just be like what is wrong with humans it stresses me out and then recently I've just started to think like, this happened this morning at the gym. I was coming out and uh, there was a, a person who was walking out and I, I held the door for her and she did not acknowledge us in any way. And I was like, come on. Mm-hmm. And then I was standing there still holding the door like a dummy, like judging this woman for yeah. not acknowledging that I mm-hmm. held the door. And then I was like, you know what, jerk? Now you're just going to stand here and hold the door for someone, not expecting anything, yeah. but just because you're trying to do a good service. Mm-hmm. And this woman walked by me holding the door, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. She had beautiful hair. I'm like, your hair looks so beautiful. <laughs> and she was like, thank you. Aww. I'm like, you know what? If you want goodness in this world, 
put it out there and don't expect other people to give you the goodness be the goodness that you're putting out mm-hmm. so i had to learn my own tricks for yeah, this yeah. so that it's like if you want someone to wave in traffic be the fool who's out there waving mm-hmm. in traffic don't expect other people to do it for you right because i'm like no there this this is what we're supposed to do mm-hmm. and i'll get very hung up on what we're supposed to do which totally. makes zero sense we all have these little compulsions where we're like absolutely and trust me if, if you're you maybe you could relate to this if you're listening I will have every bit of self-talk. Like, before before I talk to my therapist about this, I'd be like, don't bring it up. Don't bring it up. You don't have to bring this up. You promise yourself you will not bring this up. Pro- okay, I promise. I promise. By the way, why did you knock the tray off the table? I just want to know, like, that that was me. Like, such a compulsion to bring up things. But we have to learn about ourselves. Yeah. We are the greatest project we'll work on. We have to learn about ourselves in such detail and learn these little hacks of, like, we are this way. We don't have to be- beat ourselves up. Like, we can lean in with compassion. We can love ourselves, and that's okay. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. I do have to ask, like, you know, you have gone from, I made videos on YouTube, mm-hmm. to this massive career that you have today. That is no accident. And that, from the outside in, at least, looks like something that was really self-propelled. Not that you didn't have absolute support and people assisting Mm -hmm. you along the way but can you talk a little bit about your career Mm -hmm. and what that looked like coming up and also what that looks like going forward because a lot of women who listen to the show are building careers they have dreams they want to write Mm -hmm. a book they want a podcast Mm -hmm. they want to you know act or host a game show or do whatever like tell us about that part of your journey totally yeah so I started making YouTube videos in 2010 And when I started making YouTube videos, I truly had no idea that this would flourish into any type of career. It was me being creative, spontaneously posting videos, snowballing into, okay, two videos a week. Okay, I got an email about doing like a stand-up thing. I guess I'll try that. Every part of my life has really been like, it's being made up as we go because YouTube was so new at that time. Um, I quickly went from creator to, as most creators can relate to, business i feel like it's it's one and the same these days um i moved to la in 2015 and a lot of my career has been i didn't think this was possible but this opportunity is coming to me and now i need to decide to make the leap or not make the leap cool i have been the type of person that has always made the leap i don't think in my entire career there's i'll give you one example of me not giving the leap that is two years ago i was asked to be part of the nba all-star game and I was so insecure about my skills that I said no. That is the one time I didn't take the leap. That is the one time. And you I will regret, regret it forever. I, know, I was going to say. I was a pandemic. It was rough. I ate cookies every single day. I was. It was a rough time for me. And I regret it every single day. I was like, they asked me to be in the NBA All-Star game. I said no because I was so insecure. It's okay. Okay. The universe hears hilarious. me. It'll come back around. But other than that one time, I've always taken the leap. So my career is a series of decisions towards being uncomfortable honestly it's doing the scary thing it's doing the thing i have no idea how to do Uh, it's making the mistake it's failing it's doing it again and it's also making it up as i go along you know in in many parts of my career whether it was youtube whether it was late night there wasn't always people i could ask advice for because there was no one else really in those situations right and so there was no rules to follow also so a lot of my career i also say is like breaking the rules inventing the rules reinventing the system breaking the mold um now I do TV, film, scripted, unscripted. I have my own production company. But part of everything I do, and and I think this is the one piece of advice, if people are open to it, I would tell people, is with everything you do, no matter what your career is, I think we do really have to all pick and identify what that chip on our shoulder is and very much so make a part of our work. So S- Mine being gender, gender, equality. gender inequality. Yeah. As I've mentioned yeah. now, <laughs> take a drink every time <laughs> I say gender inequality. <laughs> but it's true. And the reason it is is because... Listen, I think as people, the internet convinces us that we have to care about everything. And I think as humans, we want to care about everything. You see a lot of posts online, you see a lot of sad things happening in the world, and you do care. You are sad. You do want the best for people. But you know as a person, you can't possibly know everything about every cause, nor yes. can you stand for every cause. And I think it's our job as job as people to be like, what in my life irks me so much that this is the cause that I will dedicate myself yeah, to I'll die we all on have this it hill. exactly yeah. we all have it because if you're listening to this you either have stories about struggling with your body struggling with your mental health struggling with racism struggling with finances you have something in your life where you're like oh that is the thing that really is the chip on my shoulder and I wear it with pride mine is gender inequality because I was born the second daughter in an Indian family 
my birth was not celebrated. It was very much so disappointed mm. at disappointment. And I feel like my entire upbringing in my like literal blood and DNA, I felt constantly this need to prove that like I can do this as a girl. And not only will I do it, I will do it the best and I will show you. And again, I'm not arguing whether that's healthy or unhealthy, but that is what drives me Absolutely. in a lot of my life is being like, oh no. A so I actually use this hashtag in a lot of posts. Like if I do something amazing, I put a daughter did that. Just as a reminder, like a daughter did that. Um, but anyways, so that's part of a lot of what I do. I have a, a fund dedicated to helping girls and women in India uh, across various places in India in various ways, but mostly towards just like empowering them through education and making sure that they can reach their fullest potential doing all the things they want to do. Um, so that's in everything I do, whether I'm doing like a movie or a TV show or whatever it is that my production company is doing, that will be somehow intertwined into it. Can we talk about the late night show? What yes, let's talk about the like late night show. Yes, please. So how long was that in coming about? Not very long at all. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, I did not grow up with the dream of being a late night host. And I know that's frustrating for some people to hear because some people do grow up with that dream. Um, and I got the opportunity to be a late night host. And so perhaps I was not deserving of that opportunity. But I <clears throat> always wanted to act. But the thing I want to do more than anything is break the mold. I'm rebellious. I want to prove, like I said, a chip on my shoulder. So when this opportunity was brought to me, I did not say yes because I loved late night and I love the machine that is late night and I watched it growing up. I said yes because I thought, ooh, this is a chance for someone different to step into this yes. arena and to bring a different voice. So you didn't pitch the idea. It was Absolutely more like, hey, there, someone's making a show and we need a great host. Actually, they came to me and asked me to be the host and I said no. And they came back a month later. And I'm a big believer of the universe being like, hey, sign. Yeah. Maybe you should do this thing. Yeah. They're coming back again. Um, and so the second time I said yes. Cool. Mm -hmm. So they come back. You're like, yeah. oh, my gosh, I'm going to do a late night show. I I'm asking because, like, number one, how few women have mm -hmm. ever been able to step into that space. Correct. What was that process like? Like, they had fully built a show and you're jumping in. Or now you're going to work with them to make this show exactly what you want it to be. A little bit of both. Okay. Um, I was stepping into a machine that I knew nothing about. So I went from making YouTube videos with five people to going on to a late night set with 100 plus people whose jobs I did not understand. I was like, what is your job? Wow. You are a script supervisor. Like, what does that mean? What, what are you doing? I don't understand. What do you mean that the monologue has to go through legal and they're going to give me notes? What do you mean I can't make this joke about Taco Bell because they're a sponsor? Like, what are you saying to me right now? How you know what I mean? funny. So it was a little bit of me. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus saying that, like, oh, I had a bunch of ideas and they didn't listen to them. That's not true. I was learning way too much stuff in way too short a time for me to actually have any real idea of what I wanted the show to look like. Right. I knew I wanted to have different guests. I knew I wanted to be a little looser. But I also trusted the guidance that was bestowed upon me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I believe that guidance was correct for my voice now in hindsight? Not necessarily. Right. Right. At that time, did I know that? Absolutely not. I think like we all find our, well, I shouldn't say we all, but any anyone who's sort of working on a career that has a platform around mm -hmm. it, you get these opportunities that are so massive and you're like, holy crap, mm -hmm. you want me to do that thing? And it's only through hindsight later that you go, that was an amazing opportunity, but probably not the best for me to, ex like the thing that people love about mm -hmm. you is maybe not translatable right. to like a network. You know what I mean? You know what I was thinking about actually coincidentally last night? I don't know why I was thinking about it last night. Maybe I anticipated this conversation yeah. today. But a lot of people have asked me in podcasts, like, would you do it again? If you, because it ha happened for two seasons and I've talked about it a lot, saying it was a great experience, also one of the most tor torturous experiences of my life. I've said this, that it was really? great and also very, very hard. Because mm. it was uh, exhausting? Or? It was exhausting. It was extremely underfunded, extremely under-resourced. It was very, very tough. Amazing opportunity, made a lot of great friends, learned a lot of stuff. But if I could do it again, I, I here's my final answer that I've never given anyone else. Yes. If I was to do late night again, there is two things I would change. Only two. It would be if I'm doing a late night show, you need to guarantee me X amount of seasons and X amount of budget for each season. And so, the reason I yeah. say that is because 
they hired me as a host because they wanted a new type of audience to start watching late night that's let's just be real that's what it is they wanted younger people they wanted women maybe they wanted people of color whatever it is they wanted a new type of audience that's why people would hire someone like me right we want someone younger and fresher and all those things but if your late night audience is not used to that if your late night audience looks one way right now Mm -hmm. because your late night host looks one way yeah that takes time it's gonna take a minute that cannot happen in one or two seasons yes that it just doesn't work that way yeah a show needs multiple seasons to find a voice to figure out what works what doesn't work all that type of stuff but also i'm gonna put the asterisks on there of saying both of my seasons were pandemic seasons Oof. so that is another thing i learned yeah because as hard as it was the universe was like we're also gonna throw in a pandemic just one more we're thing gonna have you're gonna have we're someone a pandemic up your nose yes, exactly. every day yes correct wear a mask so my second yeah. season of my show was completely zoom interviews was it really the first season of my show was released during the pandemic um but yeah so if i could do it again i i I joke so many times be like i would never do it again but if i actually was to do anything like that again i'm a smarter person to know what it actually takes to make something work. of course well as someone looking on from the outside it was only the most inspiring thing ever yeah because it was it was so i mean you say you want to break the mold you did it was unlike i mean just the power suits alone just Thank you. The power Thank suits you. alone Thank you. were worth the whole thing. Can I tell you about two cool things? Yes, please. Is that okay? Of course. And then you can cut them out if you yeah. want to. But I want no. to tell you about two cool things. Yeah. That kind of really. There are two things I'm working on. And here's the thing when I go on podcasts and when I talk to people, I'm down to just have conversations. And I don't really like plugging things. But I'm going to make an exception for two things yeah. because they relate directly to what we're talking about. Cool. <clears throat> so we talked a lot about safe space of like meeting people where they are, progress, not perfection. So me being such a nerd for gender inequality, take a shot, I said it again. <laughs> me being such a nerd, uh, my fund, Unicorn Island Fund, I really am leading it in a way where I'm like, being really honest about the issue. And so I'm gonna be really honest here too. If you're listening to this, I am well aware that when people talk about gender inequality, there is a group of people that roll their eyes and they're like, oh, this thing, yep. everything's about gender these yep. days. It's such an unsexy topic. It seems so overwhelming. I'm so aware of that. And so Unicorn Island Fund is really trying to make this entire issue just way more accessible and to be really honest about it. So what I've done is every Friday on the Instagram account for Unicorn Island, I post a one minute video where I just teach people about something related to gender inequality. Because what I've learned is, you know, I go to the UNGAs all day long, the United Nations General Assembly, for those that don't know. I go to all these rooms with all these world leaders and I say the same thing to them every time. I say, world leaders, hear me when I say the average human being doesn't know a single thing you are talking about in this room. And they never believe me. But it's true. I've done polls with my audiences where I've asked, like, do you even know what gender inequality means? Do you know why it's an issue? Do you know how it affects you? People do not know. Yeah. It's so inaccessible. It's so unfun. And it's so unsexy. And I'm trying to change that. So I've, I started this little series called Friday Fun Days, A, to end your week, where I'll just teach you one, and through one minute a very accessible, easy thing about the issue and how you can help, just because I don't want it to be an issue that is so uptight and inaccessible. So that's the first thing I'll say, which is a cool thing. So on Fridays, if you want to learn something new, you can go there. Um, the and that Instagram is? It is at Unicorn Island, which is my fund and my Perfect. production company yeah so like if you don't know what an sdg sdg is if you don't know what unga is if you don't know what goal five means if you don't know what the gender gap is it's okay yeah it's a safe space no one's judging you i didn't know either i'm happy to teach you so that you can be on our team as we help to be on a mission to empower girls cool that's what that is second thing you're gonna really like this one are you ready this, yes. is, this is sick okay i wish when i was younger i learned about mindfulness like i we're talking about self-love we're talking about what does self-love look like? I think one of the reasons a lot of my personal development has happened in the last year or two is because I was a little late to learning about self-love, honestly. Not holding that against myself. We're all on our own journey, but I don't think I ever had conversations as a young person about loving yourself. I didn't learn about it in school. Didn't learn about reflection in school. Didn't learn about any of that stuff. So I'm trying to change that. Um, I have a kids animated series coming out and I bring it up because it's free, free baby (laughs) on YouTube. It is called The Mindful Adventures of Unicorn Island. It's coming out September 12th. Cool. It is 11 minute episode, kids animated series where Lily learns to meditate and when she meditates, goes into the magical world of Unicorn Island 
and every episode teaches kids one mindfulness exercise. That's cool. And it's like a really fun, comedic, wacky show for kids and honestly for adults. Every episode I've watched, I'm like, ooh, I feel better after watching this. I I felt felt that. I was like, ooh, (laughs) I felt this one. But I know if there's any parents listening or if you're like a sibling or if you're aunt or your uncle or whatever it is, you have kids. um, I'm a big believer of this show. Both of these things are free. Awesome. They're both free. That's so cool. We're just out here trying to make the world better than we, we found it, Amen. baby. That's what we're trying to do. This has Some been. things are out there to make money, and yeah. some things are just like, you know what? This is yeah. just me being of service. Yeah. So that's yeah. what that is. That's so cool. Thanks for letting me word vomit Oh, my you. God. All day. Yeah. This has been such a treat. What comes next? Because, like, you're doing all these things and have done all these things. And I am super passionate about women, like, calling a shot. This Mm -hmm. is the mountaintop that I'm headed Mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. What does this season look like for you? (sighs) You know, besides, like, world domination. Yeah, (laughs) that. (laughs) I've been thinking a lot about the impact I want to make in life. And for so long in my life, it has looked a certain way. It has looked... And this industry has forced me to look at it a certain way. It has looked like numbers. It has looked like accolades. It has looked like, you did this movie. You got this review. You got this show. You did this thing. I am not a point in life where I realize that I could get all the numbers and all the things, and it's all going to feel the same, give or take a little bit. It's all going to feel the same. Yes. Five million subscribers and 10 million subscribers are going to feel the same. Exactly the okay. same. And honestly, yes. it's one of those things you hear people say, you roll your eyes, you're like, ooh, easy for you to say. No, it really is true, but you won't believe us until 100%. you have. And then you're like, oh, you're right. And that's why what was so healing about Late Night is me knowing that as well. Having two seasons or having 10, if it ended after two or 10, would have felt the same. Right. I know that. Right. It, at the end of the day, it would have felt the same. So I'm trying to think of how to have an impact in a way that goes beyond that. And I think honestly, truly, This is not just me trying to be like, look at me, I'm such a good person. But I think the only thing that doesn't feel the same is being of service. Yeah. It is the thing where you wake up and you're like, oh, but it does matter. Helping one person, helping five people, it doesn't feel this. That means something for five lives. And so, yes, I love entertainment and I want my production company to make a ton of movies and do all the cool things, but... I want the art we're making and the stories we're telling to change lives. I really want to fearlessly create art that will speak to people and not be scared about ruffling feathers with people that don't see it. Yeah. A prime example being like Barbie. Like honestly, what I think is so fascinating about Barbie is that the creators of that movie could knew for sure that like there might be some dudes that like really don't like this and you know what they didn't give an f yes like i want to have that level of fearlessness where i'm like i'm making this for a group of people who really appreciate this and there might be some people that don't understand it Mm -hmm. and that is okay right but i need to impact those lives that are waiting to be impacted like that's what i'm trying to do well what was so cool about that too was that it, it, this is much harder than I think people realize is that she made something that was wildly commercially successful mm-hmm. and started a conversation mm-hmm. or continued a conversation or and I know that there are people who are like you know we were feminists in the 60s and we were burning our bra and this is taking us back and I'm like y'all mm-hmm. this movie was hilarious mm-hmm. it was so good it was so thoughtful everyone in it was like every single part of that was so well done that i was like i wish that i i wish i knew greta so i could just yeah, be like 100 that was the most amazing and i hope you are so proud of yourself because you did something through entertainment like you said through comedy mm-hmm. that we all thought we were coming to laugh and eat popcorn and actually it you left going oh wait a minute oh yeah okay this is a much totally thing and you know what she did i i keep saying this to people and so this is actually my real answer, my conclusion answer, what I'm going to tell you is where I'm going to go, what's next, what this next season is, is I'm going to be a pivotal part of changing the culture around how women and girls are treated. That is what my answer is. Hell yeah. Because I think that's what that movie, I have felt something, I was having this conversation with a friend yesterday, I felt something where I'm like, Barbie, Beyonce, mm-hmm. Taylor Swift, yes. there's also a Bollywood movie that came out recently that was like really feminist as well. I'm like, there's something happening. Something shifting. Something is shifting. Yes. Where women are like, oh, we're going to be so unapologetic yeah. about what we know to be true right. and what we know we need. And I want to be part of that shift. Yeah. Like, I feel something happening. As a side note, have you seen the Beyonce tour yet? 
Oh, are I, you going I next will weekend? be seeing it. You're going next weekend. On September 2nd. Yeah. Okay. I will be. Okay. I yes. love that. I actually saw it in Toronto. Oh. I will be going back again. Okay. This next weekend. Amazing. Because that's where we're at. Is life. that why you're glowing? That's why you I'm glowing. I'm ready. Beyonce I'm ready. She's going to have a totally different outfit. Oh. Blue wasn't in Toronto, so I'm really hopeful. Blue's okay. Blue's playing because, you know, that's Beyonce's birthday weekend. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So her actual birthday is September 4th, and I feel like that's the show we all want to be at. Oh. But okay. it's a Monday night. So that's think about aggr- it. It's aggressive. Yeah, it's aggressive. I, I got to be up the next day. So <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, I want to hang out with you forever. I want to hang out with you as well. I want to be your best friend. I also want to be your best friend. And I'm not happen. just saying that. Yeah. Even when we stop recording on these, I'm going to carry on this conversation. Perfect. Yes. I might even, we, maybe we could exchange like a phone number. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. You could yeah. say no if you Summer want. Summer party. Yeah. Okay. I'm in, I'm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm into all of this. Perfect. I'm into all of this. Um, just in case people are not already following you, getting the magic, yes. tell them where they can find you online. It's very possible that you're not. I'm completely okay with that. Um, yes. You can follow me on Instagram at, at Lily, L I L L Y. I always like to spell it because for important. forever. People have misspelled my name, L I L L Y. Like I said, Unicorn Island is my fund and my social impact effort, my charitable effort. It's at Unicorn Island, spelled normally. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I'm just glad, even if you don't follow me, that I hope you gain something from this conversation. Yeah, thank yeah. you. This was sick. Oh, this was so great. Oh thank my you. gosh. Ah!